collection. We do have one adorable tinfoil hatted crackpot Harvey who is about to go home with some lucky audience member tonight uh, and, and help block the surveillance on your brain and make sure that the government can't read your brain waves. Ryan, if you'll do the honors. Thank you, Steen. Our lucky winner tonight is Quintessa. Is Quintessa here? Can you whoop loudly? Oh, she's coming. Next, a friend of Odslon to talk about another project you may be interested in. Hello, I'm Ryan. And I've said this before, and I will say this again, and I will stand by this assessment. I am probably one of the most publicly naughty members of Odslon. Publicly. Publicly. I can prove this because every month I bring that naughtiness, that delicious, delicious filth to your ears with the Dirty Talk Game Show. It's a chance for you to see four panelists fighting each other in the clock with nothing but their tongues. That's right, their tongues on display for your amusement. Do you want to see the Dirty Talk Game Show? Do you want to see the Dirty Talk Game Show? The next show is July 23rd at Code Word. What did I say? July 23rd at Code Word! The Dirty Talk Game Show. Thank you, Ryan. And now, to continue our evening of crack pottery, we have more pseudoscientific pseudo theory gone awry. Please welcome to the stage, Crystal Riley, to talk about the failed theories of the ether. Hello, all. I see that people are still wandering around. Do people want to sit down? I mean, I'm about to say some cool shit, so. I'll pull this down a bit. So uh, the ether is this uh, amazing time in physics. Oh, I should introduce. Uh, I'm Crystal, and I love particle physics. Let's just start there. The ether was this cool time in physics where physicists were trying to explain what they were seeing in the world without actually knowing what was going on, and it resulted in some amazing theories. I'm going to run you through a few of them, but first we're going to get a little bit of a background about why we even got to this point. First of all, you've kind of seen this argument before. Light, is it a particle, is it a wave, oh no. It's, 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 it's both, we know that now with our modern hats, we're just like, oh, you silly physicist, you don't know anything. Uh, but it was, it was an interesting time because um, there, there are some properties of light that behave very wave-like, you know, um, Pink Floyd. You get, a, you get a nice little refraction, what happens. And if, if it were a particle, it would just, like, you know, bounce around and, I don't know, do particle things. You also get this cool thing, which, you know, now that we have lasers, we know about. It's called diffraction. You don't really see it that often with light, but we do see it with waves, like the ocean. Yeah. Have you seen this before? We're in the bay, get this kind of cool pattern where it goes through a little hole and it gets little circles. I don't know, waves are cool. But, so, so those are two reasons why uh, light behaved as waves. Um, well, there are some reasons that light behaved as particles. Uh, for example, if, if light were just a wave, you would stand in a mirror and you'd look fuzzy. Um, I, I looked in a mirror and unless you have, you know, poor vision, I tend to look okay, so. Um, so partic they're particles because they bounce and they come back with the same momentum. So there's, there's that. And there's the other, other reason why they're particles, which is whenever you look up at the sky at night, uh, you see these cool little sparkly things. And uh, those are stars. And uh, you, you see them as discrete circles and not these really fuzzy things, which you would see if they were waves because they, they would interact with other stuff. So there, there are reasons for both. Um, and until uh, this guy, Newton, with the cool hair and uh, other great things, 
like apples and whatnot. Uh, no one really talked about light until Newton came up with the particle theory of light, uh, which is actually really crazy and ahead of his time. Uh, it, was, it was really great. And to explain all the reasons that uh, light didn't behave as a particle, like the diffraction we talked about and the whole uh, uh, refraction and other great things that light has that isn't particle-like, uh, he, he basically said, light is particles, but it's going through something funny. I don't know what it is. Um, but it causes them to not behave like normal particles. So there's this funny thing that makes the particles not particle-y. That's uh, not a direct quote, unfortunately. Uh, he called this thing. He called this thing the ethereal medium, uh, which, uh, by the way, the optics was published in English, which I did not know until I was researching for this. Uh, and so he did actually literally call it the ethereal medium, uh, which actually, like, with with your crackpot heads, like, <laughs> you're so cute. Um, but it actually made a lot of sense considering where he was coming from. Um, if you take light and uh, you uh, shine it through a, a through some water. Uh, or your or your drink glass, hold it up to the light. You you get you get some funny patterns on the ground that happens from 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 refraction, and uh, so so his idea was whenever it changes going through different stuff, then uh, it'll change directions, and so it made sense that that would happen when going between a vacuum, so you suck all the air out of a glass tube, and going through air. And so he was like, oh, there must be another thing that it is going through. I'm going to call it the ethereal medium. Here is his uh, direct quote, un un unlike my particle-y particleness. Uh, essentially, he called it a super gas uh, that was the ethereal medium. And it was used to explain the fact that his particle theory of light that he published in optics had some weird stuff about it that he couldn't explain. But he could explain it if the particles were going through something weird. So there's something in permeating the universe that makes light act funny. This was uh, the uh, well-held theory of uh, how light traveled for a long-ass time. It's 1818. It is over 100 years later. We have not had any questions of this. And in fact, 1818, uh, the, this, this guy with the great wispy hair, reminds me of some of my friends up there, yeah. Uh, the, this guy is um, Augustine Fresnel. Uh, and he's kind of the first to really talk about light as a wave. Before then, nobody really talked about light. Then Newton was like, it's a particle, bro. It just travels through funny stuff. Uh, and then Fresnel was like, no, 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 no. It's a wave. And let me tell you why. He thinks it's a wave because he studies polarization. Polarization, if you don't know much about polarization, uh, polarization is uh, what makes sunglasses um, look, uh, when you turn your head funny, it makes them, makes them look funny. I don't know if you've ever done that with sunglasses. I do it all the time, but I love particles, so... Uh, it also is what makes privacy screen privacy screens. The idea is that he travels through the, the light travels through these uh, filters, and it changes the orientation of the light, so you can only see it whenever you're looking at it straight on, uh, which is why privacy screens work. So yay for not stealing your stuff on your computer. Uh, but here's a, here's a quick question. So he knows that part. Of, uh, he knows that light is waves uh, because he can get polarization to happen with light. Uh, but here's a quick question, guys. Uh, do we have sound in space? Star Trek gets it wrong all the time, and it's so disappointing. Um, th that's because we know that sound is like waves through the air, and when there's nothing for the sound to travel in, it doesn't make any noise because there's nothing there for it to travel in. Well, it's not just the air, right? Uh, because you can hear funky sounds when you put your head under a pool. And so all that really happens is that you need the, the wave needs something to travel through. And, and we re generally refer to that as a medium. Not that, but that. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is the wave equation for determining the speed of a wave traveling through a thing, um, which, yeah, physics. Uh, this is the only equation I'll put up, so if you're math scared, it's okay. Uh, um, so this basically, yeah, this says that the speed of a wave is dependent on this funky M letter, which is a mu, which is representing, representing the density of the thing it's traveling through. Um, that's a necessary detail. All you need to know is that it was hot stuff in physics to figure out what mu was. We need to know what mu is, because we think there's an ether, there's a thing that light is traveling in, and if we know mu, then we know the speed of light. Big deal, it's 1818, guys. We don't know the speed of light yet. Uh, but, so there's, the ether is getting a lot of scrutiny because they're trying to figure out what the speed of light is, but also because just like in the 2000s when every, everyone thought Wi-Fi was frying their brains, everybody thought the ethereal medium was making their children something. I don't know, it's 1818, and crackpot theories have existed since the beginning of time, as we've learned from these talks. 
so, uh, there, so long story short, everyone's talking about the ether because either you're someone who believes that it's making your children sick or you're someone who's trying to figure out the speed of light or you're frying frog legs. Uh, so the, there's this guy, Poisson, who's like, whoa, Fresnel, there is, not an inter there is not this crazy medium that light is traveling in. Otherwise, you would get this crazy pattern when, when you shine a laser through things. And that's complete nonsense. Obviously, he's a very pompous guy, because this is a direct quote, which I love. I love when physicists get nasty. And uh, so it, basically, he, his point is that you would get diffraction with light if uh, light is a wave, and there's no way that's going to happen because you're, you're, you're going to say there's light where there's not. And so uh, Fresnel runs the experiment, and sure enough, he gets this nice little pattern. Cool! Light is a wave! He's proven it. It must travel through something because there's no sound in space. And so we, um, we obviously have something that light is traveling in. Well, let's, let's be real. Uh, let's think about the implications of this. There's ether, an ether wind, or there is ether dragging. Let's think about this for a second. Ether wind means that there is something in space and the Earth is going through it. But that, what that means is you could take a flashlight and shine it that way, and it will take longer for the light to get there than if you shine it that way. <laughs> That's a very intense idea. <laughs> the other one is, oh, well, obviously we're traveling at the same speed as that thing that carries light, and which means it must be gravitationally bound, which means the Earth is dragging it around. <laughs> the Earth is carrying light, bumbly, jumbly stuff. And thus, we don't notice it on Earth. There's this um, another, another person worth mentioning who uh, says, oh, yeah, it, 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 um, obviously the ether is a thing because um, stars, once you see the light, it moves, and so the light's not where the star is anymore. And, uh, and so basically you get these two theories that say something like this. The big ball there is representing a light. And uh, you can see that... There's one where the light moves it along, and then there's one where, like, the star moves. And so, theoretically, this was a proof that the ether existed, uh, according to science. Uh, it's, and so, this is 1830, you know, 15 years. And uh, so, someone's like, okay, if, if there's something that carries light around, then I'm going to fill a tank full of water, and I'm going to um, set the tank at an angle, and I'm going to shine a light through it, and the, light, and the, and the water's going to move. And then I'm going to measure on the other side where the light goes. Uh, that's, that's a great idea. Uh, and so sure enough, the light's not in the same place that the light was because of refraction, but apparently they forgot about, forgot about that in 1851. And, uh, and so they, they proved the ether existed with this experiment because, because the water carried the light particles just like the ether would. And uh, there was only one scientist who came around 20 years later. Uh, this guy is George Airy. And he was like, this is nonsense, guys. And so he fills his telescope full of water to prove them wrong. He, he, basically, his idea is, I, I take a telescope and I look at, the, look at the stars without water, and I take a telescope and look at the stars with water. Um, and the, without water, it's a vacuum. He's like, okay, so one, the ether is going through it, and one, the water is standing still. I should see the stars in different places, and he doesn't. There's a good note here that there are other people during this time period who are like, oh yeah, the ether is probably not a thing, but this guy is the first guy to publish papers that says the ether is nonsense, and so are you. Uh, anyways, the scientific community thinks he's kind of a crackpot. Uh, and uh, 10 years later, um, this guy, uh, Mickelson, starts, uh, he builds this fanciest thing called a light interferometer. The idea being, it's a, it's a complex diagram, bear with me for a second. The idea is that you take light and you split it and then you bounce it off stuff and then you put it back together. When you do that, uh, the light interferes with itself and you can determine if one of the splits of light went farther than the other one. So imagine that you have your ether, put your ether hat on for a second, um, then the, the light's going to get stretched in one direction and not in the other, and so you'll see a, a pattern. And then if they went in the same direction both times, you'd have the same laser back. Uh, he did this experiment in 1881, and he did not find the ether. This was absolutely devastating to him because he believed the ether existed. He was trying to find the density of the ether because he needed to know the speed of light. Uh, so that's why, if you notice, there's six years here in between. It took him six years to publish his results because he was so sure he did it wrong. He published his paper in 1887, and everyone was like, dude, you are so wrong, it's funny. <laughs> uh, and so the whole scientific community said that this guy was an idiot, 
And uh, they were like, obviously, your interferometer is too small. Uh, you, you should build it. You, should, you, you, you have statistical noise in your experiment. There's no way we could do this. And uh, there, there are some other reasons why people believed his experiment was wrong. Uh, one physicist said, oh, the ether is actually expanding in all directions simultaneously, and both sides of the laser were stretched by the same amount. There is a, there's, a, there's another one who decided that uh, the only, only reason that uh, you, you could have this problem is because the sun is so large that it's actually attracting all of the ether in one place, so you couldn't possibly measure it. It's okay, it's not your fault. <laughs> but like a good scientist, Mickelson and Morley, they uh, partner up and they build a giant interferometer. It is 100 feet. That is a large laser interferometer. Uh, this larger laser interferometer, took them a while to build it, uh, they, uh, found, <laughs> they also uh, they, they also rotated it between each time so that they could disprove the whole it's expanding in each direction idea. I don't know, make stuff up, physicist. Uh, and, and so yeah, three years later he published his results and they did not find the ether because it's not there. <laughs> yeah, and, and so this time they were very confident because they had a giant interferometer that they weren't detecting noise, they were detecting that there wasn't anything out there. The light was just going places and there was nothing taking it there because it don't need nobody. <laughs> and so, but because their interferometer was so large, they actually were able to measure the speed of light. Yay! Reached his goal even though he had to take a different route to get there, which is a big deal because it really laid the way for us letting go of the fact that there was this medium that was traveling through it and that the speed of light is something that's not because of it, the thing that's carrying it. And it was the first time that we'd really thought about this. And it was actually a big deal. Um, Mickelson received the Nobel, Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, and he's the first American to receive, to be a scientific Nobel laureate. Yay, America! But this is really important because it really laid the foundation to allow the theories of relativity and the theories of particle wave duality to exist and come to, come to be. And without, without this kind of letting go of these crackpot theories um, that we look at back now, but they were completely reasonable during the time period, then we wouldn't have been able to make the way for physics as it is today. And so I suggest that we raise a glass to insatiable curiosity and the insane past that it allows us to pursue. Oh, Ether, I want to believe. Uh, thank you, Crystal. That was indeed some, some cool shit. <laughs> Up next, we have another first timer here on stage. Please give a hand to Janaya Stroud. She will be talking about literal cracked pots with kintsugi illuminating the beauty of a cracked pot. Okay, so before we get into cracked pots, what I want to give you is two misunderstandings to guide you through this journey. The first is a story about uncracked pots. It's a story that Tatsuo Shimayoka, this potter, told at every workshop he gave in, this, in the States. He would say, a man pulls a pot out of the kiln. It is gorgeous, it is perfect. He gets excited and starts to run it over to his neighbor, but on the way there, he is overcome with shame so that it brings him to his knees. He returns home and carefully paints a crack on the pot. He then presents it to his neighbor, who declares it an honorable gift. Shimaoka would then turn to the room and say, once you understand this, you understand Japan. Now, despite having retold this story for several years now, I can only tell that story. And I don't think I actually understand it yet. Not really. The second misunderstanding that I want to give you is the idea of wabi-sabi. This is the love of the passing beauty in simple rustic things. I can tell you about it, but I don't naturally see it without trying. And that means that I don't understand it at all. 
Wabi-sabi is, is innate to the concepts of Japanese aesthetics, as the Pythagorean ideal of perfection is to European aesthetics. No Western artist sits and concentrates to look for the beauty in the golden triangle. We simply take it as a formula for beauty. And wabi-sabi is like that. It's not a philosophy that you train your mind to attain. It's a cultural understanding of beauty. So take these two misunderstandings with you, and let's get started. This is kintsugi. It's not really hard to explain what kintsugi is. It's simply a broken ceramic piece that is repaired with lacquer, and then those repairs are dusted with gold. Even the words are simple. Kin means gold, and tsugi or tsukuroi means to connect or connected. So simply put, kintsugi is just a gold connection. Now, the history of Kintsugi is this somewhat historical, but probably mostly apocryphal story. So settle in. Once upon a time, or in Japanese fairy tales, Mukashi Mukashi. Back in the 15th century, a shogun named Ashikago Yoshimasa broke his favorite tea bowl. He was saddened at the waste of it, so he sent it back to the potters in China for repairs. And what he got back was his tea bowl repaired with super ugly staples. <laughs> These staples rendered it both ugly and unusable. He could no longer feel the supple glaze in his hands or drink tea and contemplate the history of his bowl. In short, <laughs> the shogun was very displeased. So he called together all of the artisans that he had, and he gave them to the, the bull, asking them if there was anything that the craftspeople could do to return his bull to life. The craftspeople turned to Japanese lacquer, which was the other material used to make functional drinking vessels and bowls. The lacquer workers used the sap of this tree, which has the friendly scientific name of toxicodendron. It has this name because its sap causes vicious poison ivy type welts across any piece of skin that it touches in any way. These brave craftspeople dried this sap and then ground it to a powder. They mix this toxic powder with a flour paste and they used that to glue the bowl back together. After curing the bowl in a humid box for about a week, maybe two, they sanded the repair to be flush with the glaze in order to preserve the feel of the bowl. Then they carefully lacquered a thin dusting of gold and they were able to make his favorite tea bowl usable again. And so the shogun was pleased. The end. Now, it's important to note that those staples rendered his tea bowl not just ugly, but also useless. The process of kintsugi made the bowl whole, usable, and beautiful again. If you start reading about kintsugi on the internet, you're going to come across kintsugi kits that use JB Weld or two-part epoxy and gold leaf. Now, this is fast. And it totally skips out on that whole rash on any exposed skin thing. <laughs> but it makes the object unusable, which goes against the entire idea of wabi-sabi by violating the history and spirit of the object, which gains its worth through its continued use. So much like the story of the perfect pot, this philosophy of kintsugi is easy to talk about but hard to internalize. Still, Americans love to talk about it and to make really terrible art about it. <laughs> Since about 2006, kintsugi images have been running rampant on the internet with a quote from an artist named Barbara Bloom who says, when the Japanese mend broken objects, they aggrandize the damage by filling the cracks with gold they believe that when something suffered damage, it becomes more beautiful. Nope. <laughs> no, they don't. Wrong. 
And no. Thinking that you understand kintsugi from a Western quote like this means that you have forgotten rule number one of looking at stuff from Japan. And that rule is, Japan is really weird, you guys. <laughs> the fact is that Westerners who study Japan professionally for years still run into elements of Japanese culture that they don't understand. And so if something written about Japanese philosophy rings true to your 13-year-old Western poetry writing self, it's wrong. <laughs> An aesthetic based on wabi-sabi doesn't talk about gilding flaws in order to accept them. They were never looking for unflawed perfection to begin with. Instead, they see worth in the history and the story and the function of the object. In a Shinto country where rocks, trees, and ponds become some of eight million gods, a physical object that's been here for a while is a powerfully spiritual thing. To repair, then, isn't so much an act of elevating the flaw to beauty as it's an act of caring for the spirit of the thing of not wasting the history of something, but instead continuing its story. This idea is so ingrained in Japanese culture that it almost seems like it wouldn't travel very far from their islands. However, Western ceramics people cannot get enough of appropriating Japanese pottery. And that, my friends, is because of these guys. From 1952 to 1953, Bernard Leach, a British potter, brought a potter from Japan named Shoji Hamada all around Europe and the United States to talk about what real pots are. The main thing that Western potters took from this, well, the two main things, are one, our pots should look pretty Japanese, and two, you should never charge enough for a pot to make a living wage. <laughs> and from these things, we managed to take all of these Japanese philosophical traditions and water them down and sprinkle them across Western ceramic art, including kintsugi, which isn't just a lovely thing to appropriate with tidy quotes about gilding flaws. It also fixes a huge problem that we ceramic, ceramic artists have with our work, which is that it breaks all the time. <laughs> now with kintsugi, we can just use some two-part epoxy and some gold leaf, and not only have we fixed it, we've added a whole new layer of meaning. <laughs> It's become a way to say, I know I broke it, but I'm going to put it on display anyway, and we're not going to talk about the fact that it's broken other than to talk about how that makes it more awesome. <laughs> now, <laughs> you guys, uh, I'm not saying that people can't make this kind of art. In Western ceramics, Japanese tradition has become so irrevocably integrated into our arts, on, arts conversation, I don't know how to get it back out. However, it's one of those things that if it's done, needs to be done better than this. <laughs> So if you're going to use kintsugi in your work, you need to sit with it for a while. Maybe try to understand it on a gut level and make something great with it. And there are artists who have done that. Rachel Sussman has a project called Sidewalk Kintsukuroi, where she fills cracks in city streets with gold and calls it street art. Now, seen in the context of the demolish and rebuild gentrification system that we're kind of stuck in here, this is a pretty good kintsugi piece. Lee Soon Kyung, a Korean artist, takes pots that are cast off and broken by porcelain factories and builds giant sculptures out of them. She says they're fine for her because she's not looking for their kind of perfection. So what makes it successful kintsugi art versus weird Western misappropriation art? And the answer is, I don't think I'm qualified to tell you. <laughs> Most
mostly, I think it takes us all the way back to Shimaoka's story of the potter painting a crack on a pot. After all this thinking about breaking and repairing cracks, after weeks of going through Japan, looking at pots and talking to potters, it would still be hubris for me to claim that I understand why the man painted the crack on his pot or what the philosophical truth of kintsugi is. In a tea ceremony, you take a tea bowl in your hands and you turn it and you look for an understanding that is beyond words, what I call a haptic understanding. And so, maybe we just take a moment to look at this bowl and sit with wherever our understanding is at this moment. Well, we, and then, from there, we can raise our glass. I raise a toast to the cracked pots and to the crack pots. <laughs> While we may never understand you, we will sit with open-minded wonder at your unique and your storied life. Wow, thank you for a story of really cool art. Continuing the story of really cool art, uh, we have fellow Michael Salazzo, who's going to tell us about God's architect, Antoni Gaudi and the Sagrada Familia. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's see, can you hear? Yeah. Great. Um, so 91 years ago yesterday, uh, a funeral procession snaked its way through Barcelona, attracting thousands to mourn the passing of famed Catalan architect Antoni Gaudí. Just a few days earlier, he had been walking to his afternoon prayers when a tram hit him and dragged him along behind it, uh, and he received grievous injuries. Now, Towards the end of Gaudi's life, uh, he was uh, more and more involved with his Catholic faith uh, and with the building of the Sagrada Familia, which we'll be talking about. Uh, he was really focusing entirely on this building and trying to get it ready for the next generations to complete because he knew that he wouldn't be around. I don't think he knew that it was going to be that soon. Um, but he... Uh, was not paying attention to his physical form. He was gaunt, uh, he was reportedly eating lettuce dipped in milk for lunch, and that was about it. Uh, his clothes were shabby, his beard was long, and he had, that day, no identifying papers on it, so nobody knew who he was. And they just assumed a beggar had been hit, and they didn't help this person. So Gaudi lay on the street until some policemen forced a taxi driver to bring him to a pauper's hospital. Uh, and there, a doctor kind of cursorily looked at him and said, no, nah, there's nothing we can do. It was only the next day when a member of the clergy came and recognized famed architect Gaudi uh, and said, oh, well, we have to bring you to a hospital and get you treatment. But Gaudi said, no, my place is here. And Gaudi died shortly thereafter. Now, normally when an architect passes, uh, the projects that he's working on have some sort of life after that because the architect has been uh, creating blueprints and designs and there's a definitive plan, or at least there is a school of, uh, of students that have followed the architect and know what the architect's thoughts are. Gaudi didn't have any of that. He didn't do things the way that others did. He was reclusive. He was working by himself on the Sagrada Familia, um, in, in the designs of it, not actually literally working by himself on it, but uh, he was the main one who held the vision for it. Uh, and so when he died, it was only 15 to 25% complete. And these are photos from the late 1920s showing just four of the uh, what would be 18 towers and like not even enclosed and roofed at that point. Um, what Gaudi did do, though, is for the last decade of his life, when he was solely focusing on this project, and he had been working on the Sagrada Familia, by the way, for 40 years. He started on it in 1883, just a year after it had uh, been kind of conceived. Uh, and for the first 30, he was working on other projects. But he was working 10 years on it. He was building scale models one-tenth and one-twenty-fifth scale models of, of the main pieces of it, what he wanted it to look like. Uh, and these things existed. You can see some of them in the background. This was the workshop that he had there. Um, and this was what was being used to figure out, okay, well, you know, Gaudi wants it to look like this. Let's go and make it look like this. He actually wasn't telling them how to do it. He was just saying, make this, but bigger. Um, 
<laughs> so all of that would be fine in some ways and well and good if it weren't for the Spanish Revolution, which nobody expected. Um, <laughs> eh, eh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so 1936, the Spanish Civil War uh, broke out, and um, unfortunately, anarchists, and not the kind we love, uh, broke into Gaudi's workshop, set fire to it, and destroyed many of the, like, ma well, many of the very few drawings that Gaudi had actually made, uh, and also shattered a bunch of the plaster models. So a citizen's brigade was able to go in and save some of these fragments and save what few things remained uh, and kind of keep them safe throughout the, the, the war, but it really put into jeopardy what was going to happen to the Sagrada Familia. So taking a little step back, um, Gaudi, uh, born in uh, 1852, and his birthday is actually June 25th, so um, just in a, another couple weeks. Um, he was born to actually a relatively wealthy family, so his pauperish lifestyle was in some ways a, a choice that he made as he aligned more and more to his faith and devoted his life to, to Catholicism. Um, but he was uh, even known to have been a bit of a dandy. Uh, but he actually was rather ill as a child and uh, suffered from rheumatism and could not go out and do all these things that other kids did. Uh, but what he did instead with his time was he studied nature. He absolutely loved it. So he spent tons of time hiking, uh, um, very slowly probably. Um, he would ride horsebacks and he just was keenly observant of the world around him. Uh, and so this, these faith and nature were two themes that really just tied throughout his life. Um, he also had a penchant for drawing, and so his love of the forms of nature and drawing led him into architecture school, uh, and he went to architecture school in Barcelona. Um, now, he was always a little bit different. He was reticent and reclusive uh, and came up with all these like amazing ideas that really challenged the teachers that he had, and they would fail him often because he just wasn't doing things their way. Um, and when he graduated, the director said that he wasn't sure if he was graduating a madman or a genius and that only time would tell. Um, one of the other key things that Gaudi got interested in, and I'm pretty much using every single photo of Gaudi that ever existed, there's like five. Um, he didn't like his photo taken, he, he like, th but this one he's like in his 30s at this point. Um, but when he was younger, he also was very much involved uh, and, and passionate about utopian socialism. Now utopian socialism is, the, is a belief that you can move society forward towards your idyllic version of it without need for violent revolution. And the way you do that is by having smaller communities that uh, align to the ideals you're trying to move the greater society towards, kind of like what we're doing in the desert when we cudgel each other with Nerf bats. So, <laughs> pandering. <laughs> so, Gaudi from very early on had these three passions, faith, nature, and humanity. Uh, and so when he was approached in 1883 to continue a project that had just started, which was the Sagrada Familia, uh, he really just jumped at it. And in part was because this church was always meant to be a church for the people. It was going to be funded through donations and tithes. And it was something that um, would put faith back in the hands of the people. Uh, and what Gaudi would do was actually also bring his love of nature along with it. Uh, so he worked on this for the first 30 years of his, his uh, from 1883 to you know, mid-1910s. Uh, World War I broke out. Gaudi actually was going around house to house getting donations from people, asking so that he can continue the work. Uh, and at, around this point in his life, uh, his long-term patron, uh, Guel, who'd been financing a lot of the other projects uh, Gaudi had around Barcelona and elsewhere, uh, passed. Gaudi's father and the rest of his family were already dead. And so he said, my good friends are dead. I have no family, no clients, no fortune, nor anything. Now I can dedicate myself entirely to the church, which is what he did for those 10 years leading up uh, to his death in 1926. Um, this is probably a good moment to just take a quick pause and talk about Gaudi versus Gaudi, um, right? This is Gaudi. Um, this is Gaudi. Now, it's also Liberace, it's, yeah, not really Gaudi. But, um, 
One thing to note is that uh, gaudy is actually a 15th century word and way predates Gaudi. So it, it, not necessarily something that I even knew leading up to this, but I, I thought we should bring it in. Also because Gaudi can be kind of gaudy at times. Um, <laughs> You know, gaudy meaning overly ornamented. Um, when you look at one of the parts of the, the Sagrada Familia that Gaudi was able to work on before he died, it's uh, the nativity facade. Now, this church is gonna have um, a side dedicated to the nativity, a side dedicated to the passion, another major facade, and a whole bunch of other stuff we'll kind of talk about. Um, but this side was one that actually faced away from the city at the time, and uh, Gaudi worked on it because it symbolized life. Uh, it was actually aligned to the east, to the rising sun. It symbolized Christ's birth. Um, so Gaudi brought back in the symbolism of nature along with his faith and tie that into this building that was a building for humanity. So this was pretty much the perfect project for this person. And what he also did too, it wasn't just all these like, biblical stories that he threw in uh, from his faith, he threw in all these natural elements as well. He has uh, a tortoise and a turtle at the base of pillars supporting these giant uh, structures that are, are representative of both sea and land. There are chameleons to represent change where other things are all fluid. It actually looks like the entire side is melting in some ways because it's representative of life and movement and change. Um, now, this whole side was basically constructed uh, under Gaudi's oversight uh, and saw quite a bit of it before he died. But, you know, and we're about to that point now where, where they're trying to figure out, well, what do we do? The war is over. It's, you know, you know, World War II is over. It's kind of like heading towards the late 40s, early 50s. Um, one of the things that happened is there was some more interest in the Sagrada Familia and finishing it, and part of it was because of other famed Catalan ar ar artist, uh, and, uh, Salvador Dali. Dali loved this, shocking. Um, he called it a gigantic decayed tooth full of possibilities or a tactile erogenous zone. Uh, so that all of like the interest from Dali and all these other things like the war over people were like okay we're ready to recommit to this and they started moving forward and they were trying to figure out what did they have available to actually do this so the fragments came out the drawings came out um, and what they were able to find is uh, a few things that had led them forward including a photo of the drawing that uh, Gaudi had made of the passion facade, the one that would face west, that would represent death and fear. It looks like bones, it's gaunt. Um, this is why Gaudi didn't want to start with this because he thought it would make people afraid and not want to continue it, and he's probably right. Uh, it's sort of Geigerian or like a xenomouth maw. Um, the rest of the structure, like still in an artist representation here, is going to be huge. It's gonna have 18 giant towers, 12 for the apostles, four for the evangelists, the giant one for Christ. Uh, but the second tallest one, or the one, there's a debate about whether it's gonna be second tallest or about the same height of the evangelist, is uh, representative of Mary. And uh, the interesting thing about this too is uh, the sign for it when I visited in 2015 called it uh, Estella Matutina, which in Catalan means the morning star. So uh, this, is, this is tying in Lucifer and all these other things that are kind of these sort of pagan concepts but are also very natural ones. So you know, Gaudí is finding ways to incorporate symbolism across multiple uh, styles, uh, multiple faiths in some ways, finding the root of Catholicism from whence it had been severed centuries ago. What he also did have and that was survived were these models uh, that he had created using hanging birdshot, which is the one on the left up there. Uh, now Robert Hooke back in like whatever, 16 or 17, 1600s had uh, identified the ideal structure of a suspension uh, by actually just hanging a chain. The gravity will tell you this right here. If you hang this, we'll actually show you this, if you flip it over, that's the ideal supportive arch that you can build. Gaudí was the first person to take this out of suspension bridges and put it into common architecture. Um, and this was one of the key design language that he incorporated in many of his works. But it took actually a little bit longer to identify the other key components of Gaudí's work that actually helped in the finishing of this, which were uh, that he pretty much solely used ruled surfaces. Now, ruled surfaces are these mathematical shapes that require um, just straight lines. You can make all of them with just you know, varying straight lines around, uh, around planes or points. Uh, these are paraboloids, hyperboloids, helicoids, which are basically uh, saddles or cones uh, and, and spirals. 
Gaudi found this language by just looking at nature, which he viewed of as his God's work. So Gaudi took this, put it into his models, but didn't really tell necessarily everyone about it. And it took actually some other engineers coming in and being like, oh, well, these are all just these shapes um, we can use. And this is now the late 70s or the early 80s. We can now use computers to actually start modeling all this and figure out how we're going to build what Gaudi designed by hand um, decades ago. So by this point, uh, also with CNC machines and 3D um, printers, they're able to start completing stuff. So in 2015, the passion facade is pretty much almost done. Um, and it's that you know, you know, kind of, uh, not everyone likes it, let's just say that. Uh, <laughs> But you're not meant to. That's kind of the point. It's a death and it's fear and it's meant to challenge you in a lot of ways. Um, but the inside is absolutely stunning. So what Gaudi was able to do when he used all these structures, which are ba basically perfect structures uh, that he, he used by looking at trees, he's able to mo like put all the pillars that just branch out at the top. Um, and really, you need modern uh, technology to figure out how to do this. Um, but it supports the ceiling. And you don't need buttresses, which you need in other classic Gothic uh, cathedrals and, and, and basilicas. So you have this incredibly light, open, airy space in this ridiculously heavy, massive structure. Um, the other thing that Gaudi did was he basically stipulated what colors should be there. So this is just <laughs> light coming in. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're playing Where's Wilder with the Babadook a little bit. Um, so you have light streaming through, um, and the painting as the sun moves around. You have these giant organs all throughout the place. Um, but Gaudi also stipulated that the higher points uh, would actually be clear light, so they wouldn't affect the way the ceiling's painted. Because the ceiling looks like this. So when you combine all of those ruled surfaces, you get something that looks like a canopy of trees with starlight streaming through. Gaudi made a church that was essentially his ode to nature, as well as to his faith, as well as to humanity. And he once said that the proof that Gothic works are deficient is that their produce, uh, they produce their greatest emotional effect when they are mutilated, covered in ivy, and lit by the moon. But, so Gaudi found a way to just upstage all of that. So today, we are still about 10 to 15 years away from the completion of this. The ideal scenario is that they're done with construction by 2026, which would be the 100th anniversary of Gaudi's death. Already, it's taken longer to build this than it's taken to build the pyramids. Uh, this is, when it is done, it'll be 170 meters tall, one meter less tall than the highest mountain in Barcelona because Gaudí didn't want to exceed that height of God's work. <laughs> it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site visited by three million visitors annually, and it is still funded solely by donations and by tourism. So Gaudí is now up for sainthood. Um, and so I would like to raise a toast to God's architect, Antoni Gaudí, and to his triple loves, nature, faith, and humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Antoni Gaudí just has such mind-blowing geometry. It's amazing. <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of our phenomenal speakers tonight for just doing a wonderful, wonderful job. And really helping all of us appreciate looking at things a little different and appreciating things that are outside of the norm. I'd like to end on a quote from another philosopher, Bertrand Russell, who uh, had a principle to propose to us all. Do not fear to be eccentric in opinion, for every opinion now accepted was once eccentric. Now, uh, we will be back in three weeks with Stolen. So I would like to invite Christian up to the stage. He is going to be curating this fine event, and he's going to give you a couple sneak peeks. Oh, he's blocked in. Talk amongst yourselves. Thank you, Christian. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, yes, uh, hi, my name is Christian Cadrigal. I've been speaking here for about a year and a half, and I'm very excited to get to do my first uh, curation next month on July 11th for Stolen. Um, I have to admit, I'm going to kind of keep the, the sub-theme of Stolen, a little bit of a secret to later. Um, but I will tell you, among the topics, there will be uh, grave robbing pilgrims, uh, Peruvians kidnapping a Spanish child, because why not? And the story of a 12-year-old African-American oil mogul who almost had everything stolen from her. So come back July 11th to learn everything about those folks and more. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, Christian. And a reminder to you, the audience, you can buy advance tickets at the merch table. They are only $12. So please uh, visit us at the merch table, take an adventure Harvey with you, get some fine cocktail paraphernalia, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in three weeks at Stolen. And also after tonight's show, we are gonna take the discussion to our Facebook group, Something Weird. So uh, join us there and we will talk about what we've learned tonight. Thank you so much.